Well, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we have gathered this morning to rejoice and be glad in it. It is so good to see each of you here this morning. I ask that you take a moment and register your attendance in the pad that is located at the end of each pew. Pass that down to your neighbor. If you're watching with us on our broadcast or on our live stream, you can go to fumctupelo.com forward slash I'm here and let us know that you're worshiping with us. Several things to bring to your attention uh, tonight. First of all, we're Wednesday nights have cranked back up this week, so 515 meal, 6 o'clock studies. There's something there for everyone. If you have been curious about what we're doing as adults, we're going through a fast-track Disciple Bible study. And you know what? You can come. You don't have to have been to every one before. You can come on and join us. It's a great time. We've really enjoyed that. Um, we are continuing our sermon series, God Moves, and you can see that we have stickers available for you. At least we think they're out there someplace. There's a little sticker that says God Moves. The moves is hard to read. There's also a background that you can scan and put that on your phone. If you're really clever, you can put it on your Apple Watch, and it's kind of a neat thing to do um, to let you re remind you that God is moving among us. Also wanted to let you know that we have a job opening with the director of weekday preschool. If you are interested in that, you can contact Shannon Turner in the church office. And don't forget the Lenten lunches the, uh, put on by the Tupelo Ministerial Association. Uh, the theme is filled to the brim. So throughout Lent, we are meeting together at different churches. This week, we will be at St. Luke UMC. Um, this Thursday at noon. Well, that is a little of what is going on in our life together as a church. Let's turn now to our centering prayer. God of patience and compassion, cause our lives to bear good fruit, the fruit of repentance, so that others may taste and see your goodness and grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let us rise now in body or in spirit and join in our call to worship. The season of Lent can be barren and lonely, but God goes with us through the wild wilderness. Our lives are lived in seasons of transitions and transformations. Lent is a time to ponder God's providence and persistence. Together, we seek fruitfulness, for it has been promised to us. The barrenness of Lent will give way to the fruitfulness of Easter. In this season of penitence and pondering, let us gather before God. We come as a family to wait for the Lord with strength and courage. Come, let us worship God. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, you call us into a new way of being and give us so many second chances in life. May your love wash over us as we turn toward you from our sinful ways. Mold us as your people in new and powerful ways 
that we may be true disciples of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you to rise for the reading of the gospel. We hear today from Luke chapter 13, uh, beginning with verse 1. At that very time, there were some present who had told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. He said to the gardener, 
See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Well, Lord, we pray that you would open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, uh, that through the scripture that we have read and in the word that is proclaimed today and in all of the worship that we share, we would hear your word uh, abiding with us today. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. Just one more year. Uh, my daughters have all been in the annual Thanksgiving program with our preschool here. And a couple of years ago, uh, one of my girls had um, reached a certain level in this. You, you might not know this, but if you've ever attended, you will see that each year you progress uh, into a new role. So you begin as a, I think it's a pumpkin, right? And then the next year you get to be a pilgrim. And then sometime after that you get to be a turkey, and then, like, one lucky kid gets to be the chef, right? Uh, and so maybe it was pumpkin year or something like that. And uh, one of my girls says, next year, I get to be a turkey. Next year, I get to be a turkey. You know, the grass is always greener, so the story goes, or so the saying goes, on the other side of the fence. It's a familiar sensation to all of us, there's something in our human nature that compels us to look around and compare our own pumpkin lives with the turkey lives of, uh, of our neighbors. There's something in us that, that looks at what oh, is going on with others and, and wants to compare. And often we will find uh, what is suggested by that saying that others' lives look better than ours. Maybe for some of us that inspires us. Maybe for others of us we grow to covet what others have and we do not. I don't think it's quite true, though, that the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. Sometimes, in fact, the ground is very brown on the other side of the fence, but nevertheless, we cannot stop watching. Um, I've seen this in myself over the last few weeks. Uh, like many of you, I would imagine I've been following the war uh, in Ukraine pretty closely. Um, part of this is uh, comes somewhat naturally to me. I was a political science major in college. It's the sort of thing that I've always found uh, fascinating. But um, I, I, as I've watched the invasion, murder, horrible, horrible um, uh, war there, I, I've wondered if my desire to know what go, is going on there is entirely healthy. You know, I find myself waking up and I will Check news, uh, one of the first things that I'll do in the morning, and I will see what has happened overnight. And I've wondered about my own desire to do this, and whether it is uh, having the right place in my life. It is so easy to look at what's going on in our neighbor's lives, and what's going on in our world. Um, it, sometimes it's not the fence that we look over and we see that the grass is greener or browner, on the other side, sometimes that fence is something as simple as a television screen or the screen on our phones. We have an unprecedented ability to know what is going on in the life of our world. I don't think that's inherently a, a bad thing. Um, it could be a good thing. It could be a bad thing, depending on what it does in us and to our lives. But I do think it's a very basic human pattern. It's something that is common to all of us. We look across the fence and we compare our lives to others. We may begin to feel uh, inspired. We may begin to feel superior. We may uh, begin to feel grateful. We may begin to covet. It can do all kinds of things in our own lives, but it is almost inevitable that we will look over the fence and see what's happening with our neighbors. Today's gospel story is a story of people looking over the fence. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He is a Galilean, and he is leading a band of Galilean pilgrims. That's the region that's sort of north of Jerusalem. So they're going down to Jerusalem. And some people come to him, and they tell him this story. They ask if he knows about the Galileans 
whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Apparently some people from the same area where Jesus is from have gone down to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices in the temple, and Pilate has sent in men to kill them. And so their blood has become mingled with the blood of the sacrifice that they had gone to offer in the temple. Jesus, do you know about this? Maybe they're worried, maybe they're afraid for Jesus. Maybe they just want to see what his response is will be. Jesus seems to sense that they are uh, wondering, that they have a theological question on their mind. Why did this happen? Maybe these people deserved it. Jesus's response is telling. He says, do you think that these Galileans suffered in this way uh, because they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, he says, but unless you repent, you will perish as they did. And then he goes on to tell them another story. It's not just something that happens to Galileans' tragedies like this. It happens to people who were from Jerusalem too. He says, or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they, uh, as they did. Questions like this often come up for us. In fact, I think it's one of the questions I get asked most as a pastor. How do we explain tragedy in the world? How do we explain great evils that happened if God is good and has made the world good? I first encountered something like this when I was um, in just, just sort of just out of college, when I really began to think about these questions. Um, it was a moment in our world where many people were asking questions of, like this. You may remember that the day after Christmas in 2004, there was a tsunami in the Indian Ocean that killed over 200,000 people. And then in the year after that, there was all kinds of theological reflection offered about why this sort of thing could happen. Now, this is hardly the first time that people have asked questions like that. It basically, you can track through the whole of Christian history uh, where Christians themselves and people challenging Christian faith have asked this kind of question. And in fact, it's in Scripture itself. The Bible doesn't so much give us an answer to this question as it does uh, to give us the language to ask it ourselves. The Bible is very familiar with this kind of question. Well, 2004 went on as people were, were asking things like this. How could such a great tragedy uh, happen in our world, a good world that, God, uh, that a good God made? Uh, and then uh, here close to home, uh, Hurricane Katrina struck in uh, the fall of or late summer of 2005. And you may remember that shortly after that, some unhelpful theological reflections were offered and people began to theorize about uh, why the hurricane uh, had struck the Gulf Coast, and some people would blame it on this or that national sin or this or that wrongdoing in, uh, in, you know, in New Orleans or wherever, and people began to say, well, this is God's judgment on this or that place. I think most of us know enough to say and could say, as Jesus does here, that that is not the case, right? That um, God does not send these disasters as judgment because this group of people is a worse group than that group of people or anything like that. Those are the wrong answers uh, to the question that we might ask there. But we can't escape the question. Uh, it's been a long time for me and for all of you since 2004, 2005, or where, whenever you began to be aware of questions like this. And I can virtually guarantee that there is not a person in this congregation, not a person in this room, who has not had nearly inexplicable uh, wrongs come into their own life, who has seen suffering that you re and has experienced suffering that you really can't explain, and that has hit incredibly close to home. We might be able to distance ourselves from the tsunami. Um, we in northern Mississippi might in, even in some ways be able to distance ourselves and theorize about questions that happen in the southern part of our state, though many of you may have been affected directly as well. But none of us can escape the question of why terrible things happen in our world, a good world that God, 
that a good God may? And so we ask these questions ourselves. Jesus does not give us a comfortable answer. He doesn't say and uh, you know, give us some long theological explanation of why these things have happened. But instead, he turns the question back on us. He says, in response to uh, those who would ask about the Galileans that Pilate had killed, he says this, unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. And in the example that he brings up of the Tower of Siloam that falls, he gives the same response, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. What could Jesus possibly mean? What is it to repent? A lot of us in our minds have um, uh, an imagination, or we think that, that repentance is basically about behavior modification, right? Uh, that a certain set of behaviors uh, and actions are wrong, and if we are to repent, uh, it is a simply a matter of giving up those wrong things and doing the right things instead. Perhaps you have heard repentance explained as turning around. You are walking in one direction, and when you repent, you turn around and you go in the other direction instead. And we have modified our behavior. Repentance does involve a change in our behavior, but it is more than that. Now, I've encountered this question recently in a much more trivial way. My, my girls have gotten into uh, these books called the Mrs. Piggle Wiggle books. Do any of you? I saw a couple of head nods, so you know what I'm talking about, the Mrs. Piggle Wiggle books. Um, I, was, I was not familiar with these until I had kids. I think Jessica grew up with them and introduced our, our girls to them. For those of you who don't know, uh, Mrs. Piggle Wiggle is uh, a series of books uh, where all these short stories where Mrs. Piggle Wiggle uh, reforms the bad behavior and the bad habits of uh, children experiencing going through common, you know, childhood misdoings, right? Uh, and pretty much there's a very, you know, a consistent formula to these stories. They will always be titled something like uh, the picky eater cure, right? Uh, or the wanting to stay up too late and watch TV cure, or the name-calling cure. It'll always be this cure, right? And uh, as the story will go, we'll begin, you know, the story will begin, and the children are exhibiting the bad behaviors, and inevitably the parents will begin to be distressed about their children's, you know, misbehavior, and they'll say, well, we've got to do something about this, we've got to do something about this. And they'll call up their friends, and their friends will all, you know, none of them will have the answers. It'll either be, well, you know, little Johnny never does anything wrong, and so we just really haven't ever had this problem. Or we've had the same problem, and we don't know what to do, so we just gave up. And eventually someone will say, well, you need to call Mrs. Piggle Wiggle. Mrs. Piggle Wiggle lives in an upside-down house in town. I don't really understand how that works, but that's the thing. Um, and Mrs. Piggle Wiggle has some, ma has some magical abilities. Sometimes, and sometimes not, she will employ those abilities to reform these children, right? And so Mrs. Piggle Wiggle will be called upon and she will tell the parents what to do or sometimes she will come and apply the solution herself. Uh, sometimes it's just, uh, you know, an everyday kind of behavior modification. Uh, so for the staying up too late and wanting to watch television cure, Ms. Piggle Wiggle says, Mom and Dad, you get out for the weekend. I'm going to come over and, and babysit the kids. She does. She lets them stay up. Uh, all through the night watching television and gets them up early in the morning to watch more television until they're absolutely exhausted and by the end of the weekend they want no more television ever, right? Their behavior has been modified. Or uh, sometimes it's magical, right? So for the picky eater, she gives them this uh, magical uh, dust that you put on whatever food mom and dad have served and it becomes plain white noodles, right? And you eat your plain white noodles. And there you go. Mrs. Piggle Wiggle fixes the problem. The behavior has been modified. A lot of times I think we have the idea that repentance is just a matter of employing the right tricks to modify our behavior, stopping doing wrong things and beginning to do the right things. But in the Bible, uh, in, what, in what Jesus is offering here, uh, we have a vision of repentance that is much more than that. It's much more than uh, behavior modification. The kind of repentance that Jesus has in mind is a change in vision, a change in life, uh, seeing things, not looking across the fence into our neighbor's yard, but seeing things as Jesus would have us to see them. Right? That's why the message is 
unless you repent, you will perish. To repent is to have the life that Jesus offers to us. Repentance is identified with the life that only comes from God and what God would have for us. It's not just stopping doing the wrong things. It's adopting an entirely new mental framework. Um, that's, that's native to the term itself. That's just not my spin on repentance. Uh, there's an example of, uh, here's an example of this. Uh, the ancient historian Josephus, who is a, a Jewish man who comes to be a part of the Roman army, uh, writes about a time where he was sent to suppress a rebellion in Galilee, the same area where Jesus is from. And you would imagine that he would go in there and he would tell the rebel leader, look, you need to shape up or there are going to be consequences uh, or something like that. You need to, to give up what you're doing. There is going to be no fruit in it. You just need to fix what you're doing. Um, he does something like that. That's not exactly the language that he uses. Josephus writes how he goes to uh, the rebellious uh, leader in Galilee, and what he says to him is, repent and believe in me. Repent and believe in me. Give up your agenda, your agenda of rebellion, your agenda of going against Rome, and trust in me. Adopt my vision for what you should do and what you should be. Jesus means no less than that when he says, uh, and when he calls us to repent. He would have us to adopt the vision that he has for us and our life. It's not just that we change our behaviors. It's that we see the fullness of what God has to offer for us. Um, perhaps you've experienced something like this in your own life. If you've ever tried to, and perhaps you've done this in the Lenten season, tried to, 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 do some, to change some behavior in your life, Right? You don't do that just by stopping doing the wrong thing and starting to do the right thing. Inevitably, it almost, at least for me, it seems like that eventually fails. Right? Let's say that you are trying to become a less angry person. Right? You're trying to repent from your anger and to become someone who is able to be more gentle and self-controlled. You don't do that just by telling yourself, Smith, don't be angry. Smith, don't be angry. Smith, don't be angry. Or you, your own name, don't be angry. You do that by having a different vision for your life, by seeing uh, maybe a fuller picture of what motivates people, by maybe seeing the things that you should be grateful for, or having your eyes on something else. That's how a change can actually stick in your life, not bear behavior modification. Um, or maybe outside of the realm of sin, you have experienced something like this. One of my other daughters, uh, I was not long ago helping, we started a little late on this, but we were, we were trying to learn to uh, teach her to ride a bike, right? We would lived on a hill and kind of in town, it was kind of not a great area to ride a bike, so we were, we were still, like I said, we started this late, but we're working on this. And uh, as I began to teach her how to ride her bike, um, you do what you have to do. I gave her some instructions, right? You do have to explain what to do. So I said, all right, so you, you get on the bike and you're going to want to you have to pedal, right? And you got to keep pedaling or you're going to fall over. And when you feel yourself leaning to one way, you got to use the handlebars to kind of steer and lean back into balance. And you'll feel it out. And so I'm trying to explain how you balance a bicycle and how you keep pedaling and how you turn. Now, to teach someone to ride a bike, you have to use language like that in some way. But the language doesn't suffice, does it? The only way you can really learn to ride a bike is to get on the bike and begin to ride it. Um, and I noticed as she began to, to learn to ride, uh, when she is first going, she's concentrating on those instructions and on those immediate things that she can feel and putting the handles in the right way and trying to think about the pedals and doing all of the things, right? But that's not actually riding a bike. When you actually begin to ride the bike, your eyes aren't focused on just the wheel ahead of you and all of the little things you have to do and putting your behaviors into the right framework. You're looking ahead of you and you are just riding the bike. That's repentance. Repentance is to see where God has called us, to see what it is to inhabit the life he has for us. And then the behaviors come along with it. All of the little things that you have to do to ride a bike or to live the kind of life that reflects God's goodness in our own lives. Jesus then tells a story of what this looks like. 
He said to those, uh, then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. If not, you can cut it down. What repentance looks like, for, uh, according to Jesus, is bearing fruit. Um, what does that mean? This is not a, it's not a new introduction of this, of this concept, right? Um, in the Old Testament, the, a vineyard is often used as a metaphor for the people of God. Um, when John the Baptist begins his ministry in Luke, one of the things he says and calls people to do is to bear fruit worthy of repentance. Bearing fruit is a sign of life, of the fig tree being what it's meant to be. All right, it's not that the fig tree has said, oh, I need to modify my behavior and I will bear fruit. Right? It is that it has grown up into what it is called and meant to be. Now, that can be a messy process. Perhaps manure needs to be spread around. And perhaps in in your life, as you have grown up into a life of repentance, as you have seen where Jesus has called you, that has been messy along the way. Buzzy told me that I had permission with this this, uh, sermon to stir up some manure. And I don't know if I'm doing that or not, right? But it can be messy, right? It can be complicated in our lives as, as we begin to bear fruit. Uh, But the end is life, the life that God has to offer for us. And with that, God gives us the gift of God's own patience. Uh, That's not to say that there is not a time limit. There is one more year, next year and I'll be a turkey, right, for Jesus. One more year in this parable, and we'll see if fruit has been born. There is an urgency to this. There is accountability. But there is no dead thing that God cannot give life to. Uh, St. Augustine's interpretation of this parable goes something like this. He says the tree uh, is the human race, right? It's human beings. Uh, And the three years that God has given uh, uh, are the different years, the different uh, visitations that God has had to offer us God's own life, God's own presence for us. The first year, he says, is the time of the patriarch. So Abraham and Abraham's immediate descendants. That God has come to human beings in that way to offer us life. The second year is the law and the prophets, right? What God has done in the people of Israel to offer life to us, God's people in his vineyard. And the third year at last is the good news of the gospel that comes with Jesus. That is the last offering. That's why there is one more year. God has given us this good news of Christ who can change our very vision, can change our, the entirety of our lives, can give us life with Him, who moves in and through us in the power of the Holy Spirit, who calls us to adopt His agenda, to adopt His vision. And what that vision ultimately looks like with Jesus is his own death and resurrection to give us life. Who is the tree that is thrown down only to bear life again? Is it not Jesus himself crucified on the tree and then raised from the dead to newness of life with the promise that we too can receive new life, repentance from God? so that we can bear fruit in our own lives, in our own yards, not just looking across the fence to what's happening with our neighbors, but in our own lives. We have this temptation to go back to the fence, to to look over to the fence, to see what's happening elsewhere. But God has fullness of life available for us where we are in our own yard, in our own life. We can easily look out and lament what's going on in our world. Where do we begin to see what God can do for us? We begin by fixing our eyes on Christ who is in our place and who has come to be with us. 
Many over the last few years have lamented the erosion of social trust. What can we do to, about that? How can we start to, to repair it? First, we put our trust in Christ. And then, trusting in Christ, we have the freedom to trust our neighbors and to rebuild trust with each other. Many of us lament division in our world, political division, division in the church. What can we do? First, we are united to Christ who has offered us life. And being united with Christ, we can seek unity with people that we are divided from or may be divided from. Many people in our world lament a culture, what they would say is a culture of death or a culture of, of immorality. How can we do something about that as we look across the fence? First, we realize that Christ has come to us in our own yard and has offered us life. And so, trusting in Him, we begin to be faithful, uh, to, to live uh, uh, for a, a life that He has offered for us. Um, and to be faithful to Christ. Uh, we may lament a culture that we say is insufficiently devout. What do we do? We trust in Christ. And trusting in Christ, we find ourselves empowered to pray. We may look out into our world and see racism. What do we do about that? We first, we trust in Christ. And then trusting in Christ, we can reach out to our neighbors, to people uh, who are not of the same background as us, to get to know them, trusting that it's Christ who can make things new in us and in our world. We do all these things with the confidence that they matter because Jesus bears fruit in us and on our behalf. We want to look across the fence, but Jesus reorients our vision not just to our own yard, but to Him. And looking in Christ and through Christ, um, the Spirit inhabits our vision so that we can have the life that Christ offers to us in repentance and newness with Him. I pray that this would all be so for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. God, we pray that You would grant us repentance that we would not perish, but that we would have life with you. Uh, that in the places of our lives where we have uh, experienced death, where we've brought death upon ourselves and upon others, that you, through the power of your resurrection, would make us new. And that you would bring us uh, and all your people into your kingdom that lasts forever. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us gather by the waters of God's mercy to repent of our sin and to turn our faces upon God's abundant grace. God and gracious, good and gracious God, though you have planted us in fruitful ground, we have failed to produce the fruits of your spirit. Though you care for us as a loving gardener and tend us with a loving mother's touch, we stand barren and fruitful ground. Forgive us for the things that we have done, the things we have left undone, that have caused us to wither. For the sin of stubbornness and short-sightedness, forgive us, Lord. For the sin of selfishness and pride, forgive us, Lord. For the sin of ingratitude and entitlement, Forgive us, Lord. For the other sins we lift up to you in silence. Forgive us, Lord. Merciful God, help us to grow into the promise of your fruitfulness and to have courage in this wilderness of land. This we pray in your holy name. Amen. <coughs> Hear the good news of the gospel. Our barrenness is not the final word. The final word is to be found in God's everlasting mercy. God's fruitfulness will be showered upon us. I declare to you, in Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven. Amen. Let us now pray. Dear God, we've heard about the fences and the fig tree that was barren for three years. Remind us that in our lives, we also are barren so often. So often, sin prevents us from maturing and producing fruit. We came in as a sinful people. We ask for your forgiveness today as we prepare to leave forth from this place. We ask that we would repent and that we would not look at our neighbor's yard, but instead look in our own lives to realize that without you, we are doomed. Come now, dear God, into our world that seems bent on war, our world that seems bent on starvation, our world that seems bent on failure to produce fruit. And we ask and pray, dear God, that you begin with each and every one of our lives Begin with our churches, begin with our communities, nations, and the world. And let us do all that we can to spread the good news of Jesus Christ to all of your people so that we might truly produce fruit that's worthy of your harvest. Dear God, bless our church, bless our community, bless those who are suffering in the war-torn parts of the world, and may we find your peace. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory of ever. Amen. And now as a forgiven and reconciled people, let us give back to God as God has so graciously given unto us as we invite the ushers to come forward.
Let us pray. Loving God, you have set the table and you have given us every good thing. In gratitude for your kindness and mercy, receive our thanks and offerings. Accept our hearts into your keeping, that our lives may bear good fruit as we may enter into your glory. Amen. If repentance is turning around, we don't turn around and keep our eyes where they were focused before. We turn and we set our eyes on a new destination. And so, brothers and sisters, go out with your eyes fixed on Jesus and with the eyes that the Holy Spirit gives you. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.